Stewart claims that Richard III ordered the murder of his nephews. He was the one who organized it and employed two henchmen really to, to carry out his dirty work. Two small skeletons found under a staircase in 1674. They were believed to be the lost princes, Edward and Richard, who vanished in 1483. For centuries, they were just a symbol of a dark mystery, but now they are the key. After hundreds of years of refusal, the bones have been tested using modern DNA and radiocarbon dating. Science has finally unlocked the truth. It would be a critical break in the case. You know, this is a smoking gun document, there's no doubt about it. I need to calmly assess what it might all mean. We are about to reveal the genetic proof that not only confirms their identities, but also provides a shocking, precise timeline that solves their elimination once and for all. The five century wait is over. Science solves the ultimate cold case. This is it. For 540 years, it has been the single greatest mystery in British history. A dark, unsolved crime that has been the subject of endless debate, conspiracy, and speculation. What really happened to the princes in the tower? We're talking about two young boys, the 12-year-old King of England and his nine-year-old brother who walked into the Tower of London in 1483 and simply vanished. Both sons are still just young boys. The new King Edward is just 12 and his younger brother Richard only nine years old. Their story has been a black hole at the center of the royal timeline, a case with too many suspects and zero physical evidence. What most people don't realize is that the evidence may have been hiding in plain sight. Back in 1674, workmen who were tearing down an old staircase in the Tower of London made a terrifying discovery. They found a wooden box and inside it were the skeletons of two small children. Fast forward 200 years and the mystery appeared to have been solved when workmen removing a staircase outside the White Tower here stumbled across the remains of two children. Everyone at the time assumed these were the two lost princes, Edward and Richard. The bones were declared to be theirs and were given a royal burial inside a marble urn in Westminster Abbey, where they have remained ever since. But here's the catch. For centuries, that's all it was, an assumption. Historians, scientists, and researchers have begged the Crown and the Church of England to allow modern testing on those remains. The answer was always a polite but firm no. The urn was a sacred tomb and opening it was seen as a bad idea. But as science got better, the pressure grew. And as it turns out, a secret project was finally approved. In a move that was kept completely quiet until the results could be verified, a team of top tier geneticists, archeologists, and forensic scientists, the same kind of team that identified the remains of Richard III himself back in 2012, was given access to the urn. DNA is telling us. So doing the Y chromosome work, I found that there wasn't a link between Richard III and the male line relatives who are alive today. This was the moment. The team's first job was to answer the most basic question. Are the bones in the urn even the princes? To do this, they needed to get DNA. The problem is the bones are over 500 years old and were handled by workmen in the 1600s and examiners in the 1930s. The risk of contamination was huge, but modern science has an answer for that. The team targeted the petrous bone, a tiny, dense part of the skull behind the ear that is famous for being the best preserver of ancient DNA in the entire human body. They extracted tiny samples and went looking for mitochondrial DNA. Here's the wow factor. Mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA, is passed down almost unchanged from a mother to all of her children. That means the mtDNA from the bones had to match the mtDNA of the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville. So, how do you get her DNA? You trace her all-female line of descendants. The team identified a living person who was a direct, unbroken maternal line descendant of Elizabeth Woodville's sister. They took a swab from this living person, sequenced it, and compared it to the sequence from the bones. The result was a 100% match. The laboratory was stunned. The genetic sequences from both skeletons in the urn were a perfect match. This was the bombshell, the definitive, indisputable scientific proof. The boys in the urn are not random medieval children. 
They are, without a shadow of a doubt, the sons of Elizabeth Woodville. They are the princes in the tower. This fact alone is history changing. It instantly debunks every theory about the princes escaping. It proves that the famous imposter Perkin Warbeck, who claimed to be the younger prince, was a fraud. The real Prince Richard's bones are in the urn. The boy's story ended in that tower, but the science didn't stop. The team moved to the final question. When did they perish? They used radiocarbon-14 dating, a test that can measure the decay of carbon in organic material to tell its age with incredible accuracy. The results came back. The date of their passing was pinpointed to the same window between late 1483 and early 1484. This, this right here is the smoking gun. Because that date doesn't just tell us when they passed, it tells us who was responsible. That timeline definitively rules out one of the main suspects. The boys were already gone for at least a year before Henry VII ever set foot in England to win the crown in 1485. He couldn't have done it. Does Henry VII ever make a public statement on the fate of the princes in the tower? He doesn't accuse Richard III of murdering them. The science has cleared one king, and in doing so, it has pointed directly at another. But how did it all come to this? Why were two royal boys in a position to be eliminated in the first place? The trap is set. To understand the DNA results, you have to understand the chaos of 1483. And that's putting it lightly. England was a total mess. It was just coming out of decades of a brutal civil war called the Wars of the Roses. Two branches of the royal family, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, had been tearing the country apart fighting for the throne. By this point, the Yorkists had finally won. Their king, Edward IV, was a giant of a man, literally. He was over six feet four inches tall, a charismatic warrior who had brought a shaky peace to the country. He had a beautiful wife, Elizabeth Woodville, and more importantly, two healthy sons to take over after him. Everything looked stable. But what most people don't realize is how fast it all fell apart. On April 9th, 1483, King Edward IV, at just 40 years old, suddenly passed. It wasn't a battle, but probably a stroke or pneumonia after a fishing trip. His passing created an instant power vacuum. So here's the deal. The new king was his oldest son, Edward V. The problem? He was only 12 years old. His younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, was just nine. A 12-year-old can't rule alone. He needs a Lord Protector to govern until he's old enough. This is where the story's main character steps onto the stage, the boy's uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Richard of Gloucester was King Edward IV's youngest brother. He was known as a loyal soldier, a religious man, and a good leader. The late king's own will, in fact, named Richard as the Lord Protector. It all seems straightforward, but here's where the shadows creep in. The royal court was split into two bitter factions. On one side, you had Richard of Gloucester. On the other side, you had the Woodvilles, the huge, power-hungry family of the queen, Elizabeth Woodville. The Woodvilles were seen as social climbers who had gotten rich and powerful because of their sister's marriage. They did not trust Richard, and Richard really did not trust them. He was convinced, and maybe he was right, that the Woodvilles would try to cut him out of power and rule the country themselves through the young king. Richard was in the north of England when his brother passed. He started riding south to London. The young king, Edward V, was traveling from Wales with his Woodville relatives. They all met on the road, and in a shocking power play, Richard of Gloucester arrested the queen's brother and her son. He basically seized the young king, claiming he was protecting him from his enemies. He brought the 12-year-old king to London, saying it was to prepare for his coronation. And where does a king traditionally stay before his coronation? The Tower of London. At first, this wasn't sinister. The tower was a royal palace as much as it was a prison, but it was also a fortress. In mid-May, young Edward V entered its gates. A few weeks later, Richard convinced the queen, who was hiding in sanctuary, to send her second son, nine-year-old Richard, to the tower as well, supposedly to keep his brother company. This was the last time the boys were ever seen free. The trap was set. The two boys, the only thing standing between Richard of Gloucester and the throne, were locked inside a fortress under his complete control. 
Buckingham has to be considered a suspect. His character would be the most likely to have killed those two boys. He certainly had access to the boys in the Tower of London. They were seen playing in the Tower Gardens for a few weeks, but slowly they were seen less and less. And then, not at all. But just locking them up wasn't enough. To take the throne, Richard had to do something truly unthinkable. Richard's Dark Motive Richard of Gloucester had the boys, he had the power, but he still wasn't king. The thing is, being Lord Protector is a temporary job. Kings had to rule by the sword. They were supposed to lead their troops into battle, they were supposed to represent God on earth, and you can't put that onto a 12-year-old child. The second his nephew, young Edward V, had his coronation, Richard's power would be over. He had a very small window to make his move, and what a move it was. What most people don't realize is that Richard didn't just use soldiers, he used a legal and public relations attack. On June 22, 1483, a priest named Ralph Shaw got up and gave a public sermon in London, and the content of this sermon was explosive. He claimed that the late King Edward IV had been secretly engaged to another woman, a lady Eleanor Butler, before he married Elizabeth Woodville. Richard III is absolutely safe on the throne. He's been adjudged king by Parliament. Parliament, or the three estates of the realm, have ruled that Edward IV was legally married to Eleanor Talbot. He has nothing to fear from any of Edward IV's children. Why did this matter? Because in the 15th century, a pre-contract of marriage was considered just as binding as a real marriage. If this story was true, it meant King Edward's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was invalid. And if the marriage was invalid, all of their children, including the two princes in the tower, were illegitimate. And if they were illegitimate, they could not inherit the throne. It was a brilliant, ruthless, and according to most historians, completely made up legal trick. With the princes suddenly declared bastards, the line of succession was broken. And who was next in line after them? You guessed it, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Just four days later, Parliament, which was packed with Richard's supporters, officially offered him the crown. He reluctantly accepted, claiming he was only doing it for the good of the country. On July 6, 1483, he was crowned King Richard III. And in the Tower of London, there was only silence. The boys were now a massive, dangerous problem. They were a living, breathing reminder of the previous king. As long as they were alive, someone could rally an army, claim the illegitimacy story was a lie, and try to put young Edward back on the throne. For Richard III, the story couldn't end with them just being prisoners. They had to be gone. This is the traditional story, the one made famous by William Shakespeare. Shakespeare simply lifts more. Shakespeare, you know, is like all the best people. When he sees a good story, what does he do? He plagiarizes it. He just lifts the lot. But here's the deal. Shakespeare was writing over a hundred years later for a queen whose grandfather defeated Richard III. His play was Tudor propaganda, plain and simple. It painted Richard as a physically deformed, power-mad monster. For centuries, this was the accepted truth. His defenders, known as Ricardians, say this is all a smear campaign. They argue he was a good and just king and that the Tudor dynasty that came after him needed a villain to make their own flimsy claim to the throne look better. They needed to paint Richard as a child-ending monster to make their own founder, Henry Tudor, look like a savior. The problem for Ricardians has always been this. If Richard didn't do it, where did the boys go? Why didn't he ever show them in public to prove he wasn't a monster? His failure to produce them has, for many, been a silent confession. But Richard wasn't the only person with a motive, and for 500 years, two other names have been on the suspect list. Clearing the Suspects While Richard III has always been suspect number one, a solid case was built against two other powerful men. And this is where that new, groundbreaking DNA evidence comes back in because it doesn't just point to the culprit, it clears the innocent. Let's look at suspect number two, Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham was Richard's right-hand man. 
He had royal blood himself and a distant claim to the throne. He was the one who helped Richard get the crown, and he was rewarded by being made the most powerful man in England next to the king. So why would he be a suspect? The theory was that he did the dark deed to frame Richard. Think about it, just three months after Richard was crowned, Buckingham launched a massive rebellion against him. The rebellion failed and Richard had him executed for treason. But the theory was that Buckingham had the boys dispatched, planning to blame Richard and then take the throne for himself. But now, the new radiocarbon dating from late 1483 to early 1484 makes this incredibly unlikely. The timeline is just too tight. Buckingham would have had to commit the act and start his rebellion almost at the same time. It's possible, but the science suggests the boys perished after Buckingham's rebellion was already over. It just doesn't add up. But that brings us to suspect number three. This is the man many Ricardians have pointed to for centuries. Henry Tudor, the man who became King Henry VII. Henry's claim to the throne was weak, to say the least. He was living in exile in France while Richard was king. In August 1485, Henry invaded, met Richard at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and won. Richard was defeated and lost his life on the battlefield, the last English king to do so. Henry Tudor picked the crown up off the ground and became King Henry VII. Now he had a problem. If the princes were still alive in the tower, they had a much better claim to the throne than he did. The Ricardian theory is that Henry found the boys alive, and he was the one who ordered their secret elimination to secure his new, fragile dynasty. This would also explain all the Tudor propaganda that followed. Of course, they blamed Richard. It covered their own tracks. So, what do you think? Does this new evidence finally close the book on Richard III? Or could there still be one more twist? Let us know, and don't forget to like and subscribe.